And welcome everyone. Uh, this is the fourth chapter of the ISLP book. Uh, previously, well, two weeks ago, we covered the linear regression models. So in that case, the, the response was uh, quantitative. So in the other case where the response is qualitative, so we are trying to predict some categorical value. Uh, we are going to be the, uh, working with different models and this is such a scenario of classification. So we will be, learn we will be learning about logistic regression that in a way is pretty similar to linear regression. Uh, also another type of models uh, assuming uh, I, I will explain later on some other models like linear discriminant analysis and quadratic discriminant analysis. Uh, it's also naive bias and well lastly they mentioned the Poisson regression but uh, mainly as an example of a generalization of uh, the types of model that we, we would have seen till today's chapter. Basically a uh, linear uh, logistic and Poisson regression uh, as cases of the generalized linear models. So let's begin. Uh, and these notes are uh, the are pretty much the same from the ones in the ISLR cohort. So I simply changed uh, a little a little bit of things so that they can also work in this case uh, for the Python book. Uh, so as I was saying, now the goal is not to predict some numerical value, uh, but a category instead of the response. However, we do make uh, some type of numeric predictions in a sense, and that is a prediction of the probability that uh, some observation, uh, it belongs to a specific class. So really in a way, we are not only predicting classes, we are also making predictions about the probability of belonging to a specific class. So in, in that sense, uh, classification models can be perhaps even trickier to work with the, well, to define uh, the comp compared to models for numerical responses. Uh, these are the examples that we will be looking at today. Uh, let's see. They mentioned a couple of specific classification problems. Uh, we saw one in the introduction of, the, of this cohort and they mentioned the classification of a spam, if some mail is a spam or not. Uh, over here, let's see. Uh, also similar one, if a person has one medical condition or not. So in, the, in that case, it would be a binary response. Um, and we'll be covering also cases, of course, where the response can have one sorry, two or more classes. So perhaps the uh, maybe elemental approach would be to use linear regression in the case of a binary response. However, as I mentioned in the book, uh, there is a problem with that. First, well, first if, if the response is not binary, uh, again, we're working, we're working with classes that they can be in a way encoded into numbers as we see over here. One for the stroke class, two for another class uh, related to some medical condition. Uh, however, if we focus on the numbers, this one, two, two and three, they are uh, same distance apart from each other. So like just a one distance apart. But that, which, that doesn't really mean that the effect of belonging to some class or another is the same. In a way, maybe it would be much worse. Uh, for example, uh, something like I don't know an, an epileptic seizure uh, compared to something like a stroke. So we are not really uh, sorry. This ranking is not really a quite a good enough way to to try to to try to convert the classes into into some meaningful numeric quantity. Uh, I think there are some models that do account for the categorical response. If it does happen to be ordinal, there is some strict uh, 
less than relationship between the classes. Uh, but I think they don't cover it. They don't cover those models in the book. Um, and, and in the other case that I was mentioned over here, mentioning over here, if the response is binary, so if the um, well, I don't quite like this example, but if the response is binary, then what one can indeed use a logistic, sorry, linear regression uh, to try to feed the data and predict these values zero or one. However, as we can see over here, the output of the linear regression, if we are working with something like trying to estimate some probability of success, so maybe or or as they call it probability of default, so that so that would be classifying as a class of having had a drug overdose. Uh, this type of uh, predictions, they can lie outside the zero to one range that we expect uh, for probabilities. So there is that issue. Um, a way to, to deal with that would be to work with a function that its outputs are uh, numbers between zero and one. And this shape uh, is pretty much uh, what we will get uh, in this case of the logistic regression. As it describes the uh, estimated probabilities of belonging to, to, well, to the default class. So these are the probabilities. So how do we change from this line to this curve? Well, basically, uh, we will be to to convert the, the predictors in some fashion. Uh, for this case of the logistic model, uh, we'll be focusing on only, uh, first with only one predictor. So if we have this value X. Uh, okay. As I was saying, we have only one predictor X. It was a case for linear regression, but now we want to get some estimate of this probability of default, the probability that, that the observation belongs to a specific class. So in order to get this number between zero and one, we can do something like this. Uh, to this numerical value X, we would have to convert it with the exponential function. And as we divide between this specific expression, then, uh, we do get this this value, this probability uh, that it is indeed a number between zero and one. Uh, for, but now to return to this type of linear expression for the model, as we had in the case for linear regression, when then again, you can manipulate this estimated probability to get into, to get into that particular shape. We can see, uh, we calculate the odds, it's simply this quotient. And then as you take the logarithm, you we do realize that, again, there is some type of fitting in, in a linear fashion, it seems. Uh, but now for the log of the odds, the log of this uh, quotient of proportions, no, sorry, this quotient, quotient of probabilities. Now, uh, in order to, to get uh, these parameters, beta sub zero and beta sub one, uh, we can we cannot really do the, the the same method that happened for linear regression that we used uh, the MSD, the mean square error. So in that sense, we need another value, and what it's typically defined as what we want to maximize is this function over here. Okay, for two particular parameters, uh, beta sub zero, beta sub one, we want to maximize this function. And, and there's a type over here. Um, uh, and that, for maximizing this function, we simply find the coefficients, beta sub zero, beta sub one, that define our model. So then we plug for some observation x, uh, its values over here, and we get the probability of, of default, the probability of uh, belonging to a specific class via this quantity. Uh, and then again, 
have a probability that maybe it can be something like uh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.7, uh, one has to decide if is that does does that, the fact that that probability that the probability is bigger than zero point five is that enough for us to classify it as a default class or not? Uh, and in that case of working with that specific threshold of zero point five or perhaps another value between zero and one, uh, we will focus on the later part when they discuss um what the ROC curve is. Uh, and as a simple generalization, again, we have uh, predictors, x up to xp. And still, this expression over here, it is still a value between 0 and 1. And mm -hmm. So again, we are estimating some probability of belonging to the particular class. Mm. Now, in the case of more than two classes, uh, there is, I know, sorry, this was the case for uh, more than one predictor, but still we are getting this probability of, of, of belonging to the default class. Over here, it was the case of working with more than two classes. Uh, however, the extension for this model perhaps is not as natural as the one that we see in the other two that comes over here. And I think no, it, it doesn't come right here. But I, I was mentioning that uh, for the generalization of using logistic regression, when you want to predict some categorical response that has uh, more than two particular more than two classes, then other models adapt more easily to having more than two classes. And those were the ones that we are going to discuss now. Well, in a minute, uh, those being a uh, linear discriminant analysis and quadratic discriminant analysis. And also, I think they don't uh, they don't describe it in in this chapter. But we can also use a, a regularized version of of discriminant analysis, like like uh, almost like a mix between LDA and QDA. However, why would we consider even another models? And that is because when we're working with a uh, logistic regression, we're almost expecting that for each of the classes, a uh, the statistics uh, uh, for the predictors, uh, they're kind of the same. So like, there is not really a lot, of, a lot of difference between the observations when we compare it from one class to another. However, that re doesn't really have to, to be the case. It, it probably rarely is in, the, in real world data. So for that sense, now we do take into account a how do the observations differ from one another uh, when we uh, focus from one class to another one? So some notations that we are going to be working with is, well, k as the response class, uh, p sub k is going to be the, the probability, uh, well, the proportion of one class Oh, sorry, was there a comment? I don't know. Uh, the proportion of one class, uh, but for, uh, in the population, so not, not the estimate that we get from a sample. And this f sub k of x would be the density function of the predictors, but in a, but, but per class. So in this conditional sense. So for each class, uh, how is the predict how are, how are the predictors distributed? What we were estimating in the case of logistic regression was uh, uh, a type of conditional probability that is what is the probability that 
uh, the response is some specific class, given that uh, the observation has some specific values. That is this expression over here. Uh, however, now that we are going to try to estimate this other density, uh, particularly for, from the data, uh, we need to use the, uh, how is it called? Uh, Bayes theorem in order to flip these two expressions and relate them uh, to each other. This conditional probability and this kind of mirror image. And uh, well, another is a basic theorem, is basically this expression over here. And as I mentioned, this is called the posterior probability. And that is what we were estimating in the case of logistic regression. We are now estimating this one. I think it's called the prior probability. Uh, no, sorry, the density function. The prior probability is this one over here. So uh, these are the three types of models that we are going to be describing now. Um, in a way, the last uh, method for assigning a class is quite the same. So let's start with a uh, linear discriminant analysis. So if we have, we have only one predictor, we are going to classify an, an observation to the class for which this uh, probability is the greatest out of all the classes. The assumptions that this model takes into account, uh, and that usually even if it isn't quite the case, you can work around it. Maybe uh, like, uh, um, how do you say it? Uh, ah, transforming your predictors, uh, something like taking the log, or perhaps the square root, so that we get this, the, that the, that the distribution of the predictor is a normal distribution or regression. So this is the first assumption, our Gaussian distribution for the predictor uh, in each class. And also that despite the mean of the of the of this distribution being different for all of the classes, uh, we do we do make a strong assumption. So again, high bias in the sense that we, we we expect the same variance for all of these classes, k okay, classes of the response. Uh, well, as we, as we know, this, this would be the density for the, for the distribution, sorry, for the normal distribution. We are working with the, the same variance, this, uh, I think it's called delta or, I will call it delta. I don't, I don't remember the oh, specific. Sigma. Oh, sorry, sigma. This sigma sub k is the same for our classes, but this means, uh, of course, we are assuming it to be different because if not, uh, we would expect the same result for all the classes. So something like logistic regression uh, would, would have uh, been a good candidate as a model for classification. And again, then, This estimate uh, that we can we can perform with these expressions uh, is that we are trying to to maximize. Uh, we are simply replacing the prior probability, the sensitive functions, and again the same terms, but in in this sum over here. So now for the part of now that you have the data. Uh, well, sorry, now that you have an observation, which class do you actually assign to it? Ah, Ricardo shared an interesting link in the, in the chat. Uh, so as I was saying, in this case, we have some observation X and we want to know which class do we assign to, to that specific observation, then, well, what we'll be working with is this expression over here. And we can see this mu sub k, this 
uh, sigma values, they are constant. Also, these p sub k that we can estimate them, they are a proportion of each class. So, uh, but in the population, but we can estimate it as a proportion in the sample. Uh, these are constant. So, really, this function is linear in, in its argument x for the observation. Uh, so in that in that sense, we have these k functions. And uh, given the observation, we can compare these k values. And what would be assigned would be for which k uh, the output of this function is the greatest. So uh, and this is the procedure for what is called the base classifier. That is given observation to assign uh, for the class that maximizes some specific function. In this case, uh, this function is linear, uh, hence the name linear discriminant analysis. And as we can see, in this case, for one predictor, uh, for example, when x is between negative four and, and zero, uh, there would be, um, uh, this would take, uh, no, wait. No, this is the normal distributions. Let's see, let me remember what else what it is uh, Ilmat saying because we have these two normal distributions in the case of this binary response. Hmm. Does, does anyone remember what was the interpretation for this picture? I didn't get to read it, but it seems like the one on the left, I guess that's like um, the theoretical of like what it should be. Like when I'm reading the, um, reading what it's saying, like for the histogram, it looks like the dashed line is like what would be like theoretical and then the solid line is based on the observations we, we have from the training data. So it's like, mm. yeah, so I guess at where it is zero, you decide which of the two, uh, which of the two groups it would be classified as. That's what I'm interpreting as. I didn't, um, I didn't get to read the chapter. I don't know if anyone else has an idea. Yeah, for the left, we have the density that we saw right here. Uh, it's a norm for the density for a normal distribution, also the same in the right case. And as Leah said, for this picture in the right, is the histogram for the for the for the actual only one predictor variable, uh, but per class, uh, and it does seem to be the case that uh, the specific class, uh, in this case, this binary class, uh, when does the shift occur? In this case, it would be something like where is it? Where does the shift in color occur? Uh, and it does seem to be almost completely defined by, by uh, this point, this, this particular line. So if x is greater than zero, you for most cases, you would be assigning a class uh, for well, related to this color, this purple color. But if x is smaller than zero, then it does seem to be the case for that the, pro, the model would, in most cases, uh, assign a class of green. And as we can see over here, there will be, of course, some errors. So some observations yeah, that uh, they have a different class than the one that the model predicts. Uh, well, as I, as I mentioned, 
We're working with some values of the population, like this prior probability and this density. Um, but as we know, uh, uh, also uh, over here, uh, this particular mean for the classes um, and the specified variance that we assume also common along among all classes. Uh, however, given the sample, we can do some estimates. So actually, just yes, these computations. Uh, also, the prior probability, that is a proportion for per class. Again, also simply counting the, the occurrences of the class in the training data set. And, and from that, well, you can estimate this function that we will be using in order to, to assign a class. So the generalization, uh, now that we're working with more than one predictor, uh, still we're assuming a normal or Gaussian uh, distribution for the predictor. So I, I wanted to highlight also that given that assumption of normality, uh, we are considering numerical predictors. So not, not categorical for this model. Uh, Ah, but categorical we could uh, we could we could also use them in the logistic regression model. I forgot to say that. Uh, but still in, in this linear discriminant analysis model, we retain this assumption of normality for the predictors, but there are more than one, so it's simply an assumption of an assumption of multivariate normality. Again, the same mean, sorry, different possible different mean per class. However, uh, the same, in this case, it would be the variance for the multivariate Gaussian and that would be called the covariance matrix. So we assume that a specific matrix to be constant. Um, again, because we are assuming this multivariate Gaussian for the predictors. So like all of them as a whole, well, that also translates to a unidimensional Gaussian distribution if we focus on the predictors one at a time. Uh, the formula for the density changes. Uh, there is a comment. Uh, some more explanations about odds and how to interpret them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, yeah, ju just to. You know, so like it appears in the in the log, you know, of the of the session. Uh, some articles about how to interpret the odds ratios that we discuss in the regression, and also the difference between log odds and odds. Because when you do a logistic regression, you get the estimate of the coefficients are log odds, so you have to convert it to odds, okay, to interpret. You know how each of the predictors is affecting your 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 probability of the class. Okay. Uh, yeah, we we didn't really touch on the uh, how, how does the interpretation of the coefficients change because it's mm -hmm. no longer linear, of course. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, but I think time wise, uh, that would be done probably when we cover uh, next week the exercises. Mm -hmm. Okay, so coming back to what we were doing, we have this density. Uh, when we have estimates for the means, for the covariance matrix, uh, uh, performing the covariance uh, pairwise for all the predictors. And now what we are working with that we want to maximize out of all the classes, given an observation, is this expression. That, uh, that seems to be a... Well, it's not a typo. It's just a really, really wrong equation that doesn't look nice in the book. And it's this over here. This major expression of what previously, previously was linear, as we can see over here, in the case for only one predictor. Uh, and, in the, and in this particular example, we are work, we are seeing uh, what are the, the classifications that the model is doing. We have this uh, training data set. Of course, they are colored uh, 
with the different classes. So green, orange, and blue. And this would be the decision boundary. So in those specific regions, which is the class that it is being assigned. And we see, for example, over here that, uh, and I will let me zoom out first. Okay. As I was saying, we are seeing over here some particular errors that a, a class of, let's call it bluish, a, a, a class of blue would be uh, would be assigned. However, as we can see for this observation, the class would be not blue, but orange or maybe blueish. Okay, so before commenting on this specific part about uh, when we're working with a binary response, we can also get some more more indicators uh, to measure the accuracy of the model. But however, uh, before mentioning that, uh, we can also uh, working with the case with uh, regularized determinant analysis, and and that has to do with the fact that. This type of matrices, uh, what is it? And it's over here. This type of covariance matrices, and they behave quite nicely in the sense that uh, if you have two different covariance matrices and then you take an average, uh, not, not like only the, the common average, but uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, a rank average, then such a specific average also happens to be a covariance matrix. So if we want to get almost like an in-between of linear discriminant analysis and quadratic discriminant analysis, uh, we can do something like consider first this particular case, so this covariance matrix, uh, the same for all classes, and then and that you take some rank average with the and where is it? And I wait, wait, it was over here where they mentioned that you have to change it. Uh, I, I, I saw that it was going to go into that before. Sorry, I, I was getting too ahead of myself because I wanted to mention this part about. Uh, so more indicators when the response is binary. Uh, I wanted to mention that later. So before before that, this, let's cover this in order to mention the part about regularized regularized discriminant analysis, uh, and that is that uh, perhaps it is quite strong for the for the assumption for the data that the covariance matrix is the same for all the classes. So in order to to reduce the bias, we can we can accept into the model that the covariance matrix it can be different per class. So th that would be the difference between linear discriminant analysis. Linear discriminant analysis. Uh, this can this covariance matrix can be different per class, but of course we are we are still uh, working with assumptions of multivariate normality and such. Uh, now, the, the expression for the bias classifier, it does change. Uh, let's see how it is. Well, it would be this expression over here, what we are trying to maximize out of all the possible K classes. Uh, uh, however, uh, my point was that if we want to get an in-between of this scenario, uh, we allow the covariance matrix uh, to be different uh, per class. And the other scenario of LDA, where the covariance matrix is, con is constant, uh, well, you can simply consider some parameter. Uh, let, I don't want to write it, so let me just look at regularized discriminant analysis.
In order to show the formula in particular, over here. We can take this sort of average as we can, uh, the sum is working kind of weird. Okay. With this, this lambda is, is between zero and one and it, the output of this lambda would be also a covariance matrix for this expression and testing your, your model, changing this lambda from zero to one, uh, that would give you a sense of, uh, is LDA better for your, as a, as a classifier for your data or is QDA actually better? Or is actually, is it better with a, a sort of in between between those? So a value lambda, that is, it is between zero and one. Because if we, if we, if this lambda value is equal to, let's see, to, to zero, then this expression over here, if we replace, it is only this uh, covariances sub k. So it is really lambda zero, it is simply the case of QDA. But if lambda is one, if we replace in the formula, then we are assuming that the covariance matrix is constant for all of the classes. So the case of LDA. So, so that is what I meant as an in between. And there, there's also an ordinalization. Uh, well, I didn't know this one in particular. I was talking about another one. Uh, maybe it's, it's not over here. Uh, but one where you also consider uh, if your predictors are independent or not, and you have a, now two parameters that control that. So again, an ordinalization of this regularized discriminant analysis. It's not this one over here. Uh, it's, a, it's another one. Or is, is it? No, well, maybe it is. Okay. So before mentioning the part about the ROC, we're over here about comparing LDA to QDA. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, well, QDA is, uh, uh, it would be less biased. So uh, it would be more flexible. Uh, um, Perhaps that may lead to some other fees, but that really will depend and uh, for the specific model, sorry, for the specific case of the data used. Mm. Yeah, let's go right now the part of the of the ROC. Uh, it is over here. So uh, as we saw uh, the output of these models, uh, it, it really wasn't only the, the particular predicted class for given observations, but really this probability, the posterior probability uh, of belonging to a specific class given the observation that you are working with. So if that probability estimation, well, if it happened to be greater than five, in the case of uh, a binary response, uh, usually that is good enough for you to say that, oh, yes, that is a particular class that we are going to assign to the observation. So a 0 0.5 threshold for deciding the class to assign, uh, in general, it can be pretty good, but of course we can change also this threshold. It works like a hyperparameter for the model. And um, um, when you're considering many possible thresholds, so these values between zero and one, in order for you to decide uh, which uh, which is the the point that you have to surpass in order to assign a specific class given this zero probability, uh, we can compare that. How is the model changing when we change the, the threshold with what it is called the ROC curve? 
As we can see, it is comparing the false positive rate and the true positive rate. And this, these quantities are defined over here. So we have some predicted class and some well, class that it is observing the actual data. So for example, in an ideal scenario, we, we, we would expect something like a, if our model says that the default class has been detected, then that the true class observed, that that is also the actual class. So a match between the observed and the predicted, and that is what we would, what it is called the true positive. However, if the, if the model predicts the default class, but in reality, that is not the case, so in the observed scenario, the, that is what that is what is called a false positive. Uh, and in a similar fashion, also the true negatives are defined and the false negatives. And of course, in the ideal scenario, we would want, we would want these false positives and these false negatives to be zero. So basically, only point only values over here in the diagonal. So no mistakes for the model. Uh, however, even in, sorry, however, uh, it's, it's not, uh, how do you say, mm. um, how do you say, um, or, okay, okay, so, it is really not uh, as bad the case for your model to get too many false positives as to get too many false negatives. Uh, for example, let's come back to the to the case of uh, email, email spam detection. So let's consider that uh, the default class, so kind of like that the success would be, uh, yes, the email is a spam, a spam. So in that scenario, a true positive would be a uh, spam that the user received that it is in <laughs> that it is indeed detected as the model as a spam. Uh, then a true negative, no sorry, and a false positive would be um a mail that was received by the user that it wasn't a spam, however it was detected as a spam by, by the model. And what I and what I, what I meant to say is that this difference over here between false positives and false negatives, because let's see, for a false negative, what would be in, in this scenario? It would be uh, the user receives a mail that it is not a spam. However, the model detected it as a spam. And if we try, if we consider the case of something like, oh, you check your mail in, uh, what would be the outcome? It would be something like, oh, perhaps you received a very important email. However, it, it really wasn't shown to you because it was put in the spam folder. So that, that in itself is quite problematic because being the email so, so important, perhaps, then you really made a potentially horrible uh, action for the user. Maybe he, he didn't find the information that it could be very important for him to read, but you didn't even show it. However, uh, so, so in that sense, <clears throat> sorry, so in that sense, a false negative would be very, very, potentially very, very bad. So we want to make false negatives for this scenario very close to zero. However, a false positive, uh, well, there is not really much of an issue in, this, in those cases. <laughs> Because that would be the scenario where the user the user receives some mail, and uh, because uh, and it is in its main inbox, so it was not detected as a spam. So, but even in that case, well, the user can see the mail and being the mail spam, he or she will probably detect that it is spam or, and not even read it, just delete it. So, in that sense. Uh, making a mistake in the form of a false positive. In this scenario, uh, it's not really 
um, such an issue. The false negatives is that it could be very, very bad if there are too many of them. So there is again some balance. If you want to make the false negatives or the false positives, which one of them do you want to be uh, very close to zero? Uh, um, <coughs> sorry. And in that sense is that these uh, particular rates are defined. So the false positive rate, that is the quotient between the numbers or false positives and the total of, uh, and the total number of negatives uh, in the observed class. So this would be the type one error and it is called one specificity, this ratio. And also, over here was the true positive rate, yeah. And this particular ratio, the true positive rate, uh, that out of all the positives or only the full classes in the in the observed cases, uh, well, how many of them were detected as via via the by the model? Sorry. So these true positives detected. Uh, and well, uh, and its name is the power sensitivity. Recall. And again, uh, balancing. Um, but balancing this, these numbers over here, the FP and the FN, uh, that can be worked with with some specific threshold used. And um, for for which threshold it, is the model performing better? Uh, we can see that over here in this particular curve, the ROC curve, simply maps, maps the false positive rate and the true positive rate. Um, uh, the ideal case would be that uh, this curve over here is pretty close to to one, like almost almost glued to to this edge of the square. Or in another in another a similar way to define it, a better model would be one. Well, a better classification model would be one for which the area under this curve up to this particular line, it is a greatest. And let's see, oh, it's 1251. Uh, okay, let's try to go a little bit faster then. Uh, so just to, in order to finish up in time, uh, another model uh, still, this is even with higher bias than the other ones, that is nice bias. And co compared to in LDA and QDA, uh, that we're working with some multivariate normal distribution for the predictors. In this case, we assume that for, for the classes, well, sorry, for each specific class, the predictors are independent among themselves. So this is the this estimation that we wanted for the for the density per class. Uh, it can be just per, be be performed uh, as a product of these marginal densities. So why would we be using this model? Uh, well, if they're, if they're independent indeed, then you can use it. Uh, however, over here, even even if they are not independent, usually the estimations for, sorry, the classifications for, for this model are good. Uh, and particularly it can be used if you have a small number of observations and a large number of predictors. Mm. Let's try to skip between these. Um, well, just as a summary, well, they're comparing the model thing uh, over here. And it's important to mention that it's not like any of these models is better than the other one. It really depends in the case, well, in the specific data that you have. 
um, for example, a naive bias, it can be pretty bad for interpretability. So I will the inference part our models to see how are the how are the variables well the predictors related to each other. But in that sense, something like logistic regression it's much better than NDA, QDA, and knife bias if you are interested in inference. So if you're interested to understand the relationship between the predictors, uh, even if you are willing to set uh, a lower a lower uh, accuracy for the predictions. And KNN, uh, I think it wasn't mentioned in this part because in two chapters ago, it was mentioned in the book as well. Uh, but well, for time, I will just not mention it. Uh, you simply, for a given observation, you consider some K number of closest point to it. And then for those particular neighbors, uh, well, each of them has a class. So you can do something like a, a, a boat. So if most of them say have class A to, so then to the observation, you also assign uh, the class A. So it basically doing a, a sort of average, maybe numeric wise, if the response is numeric or mode wise, if the response is categorical. Uh, so you do a, an average using uh, observe, no, sorry, points that are close to the observation given. Uh, it is a non-parametric model, so it, and it happens to have low bias and large large variance. Uh, and in a sense, you don't really get la, like a particular function out of it. Uh, and every time that you have new, so it's not something like with logistic regression that we need to estimate some parameters, beta sub zero, beta sub one. And if you add new, new, new data to your training data set, then you have to compute all of the all of the model again in order to, to have the predictions. Because again, you don't have you don't get some parameters like beta sub zero and beta sub one as in logistic regression uh, as an output of this model. So it's not like it gives you a function to make predictions. So in that sense, it can, it can, it can be cumbersome because there's too many computations. Uh, let's see, and just to finish up, uh, on, only a mention of this uh, Poisson regression case that if the response, well, it can be categorical, yes, but if it, uh, if it happens to be a count, so like uh, just an occurrence, well, then this model can be used, and, and I won't mention it in detail because it's really a, a particular case of what they mentioned over here, this type of generalized linear models. So it, it includes something like linear regression, logistic regression, well, Poisson regression that we have had to skip right now, but uh, it is generalized in the sense a uh, print, Let's see, over here, <coughs> ah, sorry, where, uh, no, we didn't even put it. it, it's over here then, in the book, where you consider your response, it can be numerical or categorical, uh, but we're going to fit some parameters, beta sub zero up to beta sub p, uh, using the observations, but they are trying to estimate some computation relating relating the response given the parameters. In the case of in the case of linear regression, uh, what they are trying to estimate over here, well, that is just the, the value of the response in itself. So as we can see this eta function is just the identity, so just y. So y is equal to this equation. In the case of a uh, logistic regression, what is a transformation that it is being used in order to get this linear uh, expression? Uh, well, that is what Ricardo mentioned, this 
uh, log of the odds. And in the case of we didn't cover of Poisson regression, what is the transformation that it's being applied uh, for the response? In this case, it's just uh, taking the logarithm for that value. Um, and that works for, uh, no, I wouldn't describe it. There's not enough time there. Mm. Something to end on. Mm, no, really, that's just the end. Ah, no, yeah, an important point, just to finish up. Uh, that the assumptions that Ricardo mentioned in the left chapter uh, for the linear regression case, so something like uh, having few layers in the uh, in the data, uh, predictors, independent observations, sorry, and predictors not too related between them. And that is also a, a assumption that it occurs for the generalized linear models. Of course, what, change, what changes is that you don't expect a linear relationship between the response and the predictor, but you expect some transformation for the response to have a linear, a linear relationship with the predictors. But the other assumptions that uh, Ricardo mentioned for, for linear regression, uh, they still apply for this case of generalized linear models. Okay, and we can end in that.